This is the, the uh, Government Advisory Committee, um, also known as GAC. Uh, my name is Daniel MacDonald. I'm the chairman. Uh, I'd like to go around the table and introduce uh, everybody. Uh, to my uh, left here, I have uh, John Christopher. We have an invited guest, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ball Queen. He is the uh, superintendent of the uh, regional school district. Uh, over here, I have uh, uh, Doug Gelina. Doug Gelina. Um, Michelle O'Keefe, uh, yeah. Kathleen <laughs> Prunier, and you are. Hi, I have met you. How you doing? <laughs> Welcome. And we have uh, Betty uh, Gorski of the uh, Board of Selectmen and uh, Joe DeMario of the Board of Selectmen. So, um, those of you that don't know what we do, uh, we are an advisory committee uh, in, uh, with a charge uh, from the uh, Board of Selectmen. And our uh, uh, charge is to uh, review the uh, uh, organization and the uh, st uh, status and structure of uh, town government and to, uh, report, uh, to report back to the uh, Board of Selectmen uh, at the completion of our uh, review. So in the process of uh, reviewing uh, town government, uh, we've decided to uh, uh, look at uh, all departments um, and to uh, uh, talk to the people that perform the uh, functions of government um, through those departments uh, as those people are in the know. They do it every, every day they go to work. And um, tonight we've invited the uh, uh, school committee uh, members, uh, uh, the Groveland uh, school, school committee members and Dr. Malqueen to uh, tell us what they do, uh, what their function is, how that interacts with um, uh, the function of government in Groveland, even though it's a uh, regional school district, it's still a big part of uh, the delivery of services in, in the town, and education is of uh, primary concern to uh, many people in the uh, district, including myself. And uh, uh, with that, I open up the meeting. Uh, so um, uh, maybe I'll start with the uh, uh, school committee. Uh, remember, uh, Doug, if uh, you can tell us. Uh, how the school committee uh, operates and um, how that interacts with uh, Groveland uh, Town Government through the Board of Selectmen or other, other means? Uh, well, we meet usually monthly, unless there's uh, pressing matters. Um, we stay on top of you know, policy issues. If there's a change in policy, we'll form a subcommittee and so on. Uh, we do the hiring of business manager and other offices. Mm -hmm. So we'll put a committee together for that to review and report back. So very similar to what we do in town, I would think. But, um, you know, as far as, you know, being a district, you know, we all get together. Everybody does their best to represent their town, their needs in the town, trying to keep it on. Everything's in, and then we make our decision and vote and move forward. So, okay. Do you have um, any uh, specific questions, or yeah, I mean, you know, uh, do do you have any uh, uh, commuted how to, uh, communication uh, uh, with uh, the board of selectmen or the uh, finance director reached out? How does that? How does the budget come together? How does? How do you interact uh, uh, with the, with the, with the town? That will probably be better as the superintendent because he uh, does the biggest portion of the budget with the business manager. And together they go out to the communities and present the budget to the communities mm -hmm. in time for them to give feedback. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a surprise when the town gets it. So, so they go through a few rounds. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk, I can talk, talk a little bit about that. Sure. Sure. So about um, October 1st, uh, beginning of October, we begin working on the budget proposal. And my budget proposal is just that a proposal to the school committee. They have to formally adopt a, a budget that comes forward to you all. So I spend a lot of time with my business manager uh, assessing the needs of the district and looking at how can we best create value for the district so that we're generating wealth for the community. There's a connection between the community and the schools that's pretty tight. Uh, really successful com uh, communities have successful schools. And if, 
if we don't generate value for the schools and the community, then you'll f feel the effect because your values will start to, to reflect that diminished value. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we best use the resources we have to create value for the community you know, and, and work uh, in that way. So our budget is due at the beginning of December. December 17th this year is when we'll be bringing our proposal to the school committee. And then after that, there's a series of, of uh, discussion points that happen with the school committee. When, okay. when, actually, when you say we, then yeah. who, who initiates that process? Is it you and the business manager? How does that, how does that Well, reason? we're obligated through some timelines to uh, present it by the beginning of December. Uh, the, the adopted budget has to be in time for you all to have it, you know, for your town meeting and everything. So there's a, a timeline that we all have to follow that we're obligated to. Now you all also asked about how we interact with the town or the, the uh, different uh, finance directors. Yeah, what's the communication channel that goes on and could that, is that, does that work or does it need to be improved in any way? Yeah, it works really well. We have an ongoing discussion uh, with the uh, directors of finance in each of the towns. So for instance, just uh, this week we, we had a meeting with the directors of finance to go through our preliminary budget estimations and our thinking around what we're going to be doing to get their point of view and to keep them in the loop. And we do that very frequently. So um, last year and this year we've had very tight connections with the directors of finance and then they typically have gone to their selectmen to you know talk about you know what, what the thinking is and, and how they're prepared or not prepared to you know to move forward with it. So um, in addition to those conversations, we also bring the budget to each community, at least we did last year, and we're planning to do that again so that we have some initial feedback from the community about what their thinking is. And then that all comes back to the school committee. We have a subcommittee that we talk through this in a, a pretty detailed way. And then by the time the school committee gets it for adoption, really all the bugs have been worked out, or ideally they have been. There shouldn't be more discussion points at that time. You've heard everybody at that point. We, pr we pretty much take all the information in from the community. We've worked with the, d the directors of finance. I've worked with the uh, school committee, and we've really shaped the budget that, like for when I think about last year, we came down to about $60,000 that we still had to figure out out of $35 million. So we had really come to a, a pretty good conclusion at that point. And what I found is, because of all that communication, we had last year a really easy time to bring our budget forward. People were prepared to, to uh, accept it, and there wasn't a lot of <coughs> negotiation and discussion on the floor at the school committee, at the uh, town meetings. You know, so I think um, when I, I, I attended the Groveland meeting, I had each of my um, two central office folks go to the different ones, Merrimack and West Newbury, and so we were in, in communication, texting to each other, and each meeting went very well. You know, so I, uh, that part I attribute to the good communication, and also to our commitment about really representing what we need and not trying to force anything on the community. We're really uh, focused on living within our budget to the degree that we can. I have to also, I want to add that Dr. Malqueen missed two items and it's to your credit you you are very active in the process yeah you also have asked for time individual time with the uh fincons of oh yeah town. yeah we have a regional finance committee right. that meets mm -hmm. and um and uh each of the finance committees in the town we've also asked for time for them too so you know, by the end of it everybody's heard it a couple of times We've all uh, talked through what were the hard parts or the easy parts, and so by the end of that, you know, we've really uh, done some good work, and I think most people are happy with that. Right. In in the past, there was always a problem with transparency with the budget, and the committee, through hire and Dr. Valtteri, it was one of the things that we brought him forward because he was willing to do that for us. Show us <coughs> And go out and show the finance directors the same because all the feedback we were getting from the finance directors was they had no faith in the budget. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now I believe they're, they're quite comfortable with it. So, we had questions are answered. If the, the finance committee is asked, you know, how'd you come up with that number? There were 
the, yeah, we just the show, dialogue we show goes them. on. And you know, we have that same transparency even with um, the uh, unions that we have. I have uh, meetings with union officials about our budget too. So they know exactly where we are. Uh, we get into deep discussions about the numbers. Mm -hmm. and so everybody knows, you know, what's going on. It shouldn't be a mystery. How, how will the uh, budget in the, um, I understand there's a, a contract coming up for a renewal. Yeah. How, how can you plan for that or anticipate the uh, changes that may come down the road on that? And how do you formulate, you know, a budget with the unknown? Yeah, well, you, you have to uh, think about, uh, like you were saying, estimate what the potential of increase there might be yeah. in the budget. But each of the, so we negotiated successfully four union contracts last year. We had five, so we're negotiating with teachers currently. And um, each, in each of those outcomes, we were able to um, agree with the employees that a 2.5% per year is a reasonable thing, and that will help us to keep within the Proposition 2.5. Okay, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, yeah. are you cognizant of that? Is that uh, all the time. So that we don't have, you know, shortfalls and surprises that That's require right. overrides continuously. That's right. So um, what, what we uh, looked at with our unions is that uh, the towns are very generous in, in really giving us that two and a half, three percent buffer each year, you know, to think about uh, for growth. And uh, when you looked at some of the arrangements that were in the salary agreements, you might have a five percent here or seven percent there. And like there was so much inconsistency, we could never plan, you know, very well for that. So now, with four of the uh, contracts already negotiated, each year, each person can count on about a 2.5% increase, and so can we. So that makes it so much easier to plan and project mm -hmm. for the total cost of our budget, you know, as we go out, as we go forward. <clears throat> so by reining in that, that percent increase per year uh, to be within that 2.5% cap, we're better able to project out and to manage our affairs, you know, in a reasonable way, in a way that really is compatible with what the towns can afford and expect. I, I have a question. Uh, I'm sorry, Dan. I was going to. I looked uh, at the uh, the old contract, and it looks like there's a step system, and in the first ten years, there's a look like uh, numerically it's a seven percent increase. Mm -hmm. uh, you're very good. Which <laughs> you're exactly right. right. <laughs> with the help of Michelle CPA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so crunch those numbers, so that looks like a, you know, and again, it depends on the mix of teachers. If all of the teachers are in that group, then, I mean, it's it seems to be a, a budget buster. It, it, it structurally, it's, but dependent on the mix of, uh, you know, how many uh, teachers are in the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, employment of the, of the district. So, mm -hmm. it, it, would that require higher, <laughs> higher starting, so how, how does that? How's that up play out? Yeah, so we have about 8% of our teachers who are in the first five years of, of their experience. And what you would see in our current contract is there is a rapid rise in the amount of money that they make to about a 7% per year increase, right? But then what you see, as they approach that 7 to 10 year mark, it drops off and actually is flat. So if you're planning on a career in the district as a teacher, that's a disincentive to stay, right? Because if we were encouraging you, we'd be giving you some increase over the course of your 25, 30 years. So in our district, we bump you way up, and then we flatten your raises out or your increases out to zero for a long period of time. And at the end of your contract life, uh, 25 years or so, you're getting these very marginal, tiny increases compared to what the new folks are getting. Now, on the other hand, so, so by design, it could be an incubator or a stepping stone to that's other right. districts. So that if you're have a new teacher, pay increase. So you come in, yeah. put your ten years, and then you jump. and then you jump ship. So you so, don't get the benefit of that. That's right. Increase in step. And so everybody who runs a business knows that when you have employees exiting your district like that, you're losing human capital. You're, that costs you a lot of money. So what we're trying to think about is how do we capture a, a career incentive within the contract rather than just bumping up, having people jump ship, and then uh, the rest of it is, is pretty uh, minimal increases. So we're trying to you know, really think about that in a very different way. Mm -hmm. 
what, what the, do you have any uh, numbers on what's turnover? Is that problematic? I mean, does that well, the turnover <laughs> too is uh, it, is sort of uh, compounded by that seven percent increase. So if you're generating a lot of increase in the beginning and that's not compatible with the town and you want to live within your means, then who do you cut? You cut the very people who have come into your system at the beginning part of their their uh, at the beginning part of their career. So you're always cutting away at the beginning part and you leave exactly the people who are spiking at 7%, right? So that's not a, a healthy way of approaching things. So that's, that is a structural problem that it's going to be corrected in the next... I can't week. predict what the correction is because we, that's a negotiation item. Sure, but, it's, but it is, it's, it's an issue for us to think about. All right. Exactly. Yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> this is an issue that came up when I think we spoke with the Finance Committee. I think we, we wanted to know the makeup of the negotiation team. I know the teachers probably have their union reps and MTA rep. No, that's not true. Okay, so could you enlighten us on that? And then the second part of that question that came up discussing with the finance was, would it be possible or even helpful to have maybe a member of the finance committee uh, from each town as part of that negotiating team? Yeah, so I, I'm happy to talk about that. So in the old days, uh, so the old days would be about a year ago. <laughs> yeah. We like so, that. <laughs> yeah. So in the old days, and not just here, but in my experience too, when you go to negotiate a contract, you would have my side of the table and your side of the table, and you would hammer out issues, right? Mm -hmm. uh, today we do things very differently. Uh, we actually collaborate over what the goals of the, the district are and how we can both best meet those needs. So this is called interest-based negotiation, interest-based bargaining. And um, we, didn't, we don't bring our attorney to the table, and neither does the other side. That's probably a good thing. It is a good thing. <laughs> it's it's an even thing. though we have two attorneys here. <laughs> yeah. So the teachers don't bring their attorneys either? That's, That's shocking. Amazing. It is shocking, isn't it? So I've I never get something done, leave a lawyer home. <laughs> well, so that's kind of what, what the teachers asked for, too. So when we came to the table, the lawyer really didn't have anything to do except sit there because we were doing our interest-based bargaining. And so now we leave them at home. We save money, for, like the district isn't paying money for an attorney to be at the table. Neither is the union. And the only time that we would bring those folks to the table is if we get to a point where they were actually needed. To draft the contract. To draft the contract, to give us advice on the language, you know, because they have expertise that we don't have. But until we get to that point, there's really no need for them. So our approach has been to bring to the table only those people who are really essential. So Mike Bergeron and I are at the table, and the union president and two or three people from the union representing elementary, middle, and high school are at the table, and that's all. And so we meet in an office space much smaller than this, my office, and we meet for about two hours. Um, <laughs> And we, so we've already shared our, our first proposals, right? They put theirs on the table, I put mine on the table, and then we smiled a lot because they were the same proposals. We're all thinking about the same kinds of things. So that's what, what interest-based bargaining is about. How do we create more value for the system? Not how do we compete with each other to get somewhere that neither of us is really interested in, you know? So we're finding great success in that. We've already... Um, negotiated uh, contracts with the, the um, paraprofessionals, secretaries, custodians, and uh, there's one other group. Nurses. And nurses, right, exactly right. And now we're negotiating with the teachers. The nurses. Yeah, and, uh, and things are going very well. So to get to the question about who else should be at the table, I would say as few people as possible because it just goes so much easier. Yeah. This interest, bar excuse me, this interest bargaining, uh, that obviously you brought that in that hadn't been used in the past. That's is, right. Is that a fairly new concept within uh, school yeah, education? Yeah, it, it is. Right. It is. Yeah. So the new concept in education is how do we link together or, or partner together the school committee, the superintendent, and the teachers union? Those three elements have to be really aligned together. If they're not, you get a lot of turbulence in the system that keeps you from reaching your goals or keeps you from accelerating to your goals. So right now we have 
very good alignment with those three entities, and we are making rapid progress, you know, uh, toward our goals. So, uh, like a, a symptom of that good alignment is we haven't had one grievance since, since I got here. There, there was a interesting. There was a situation back in the '90s where I remember teachers were before school were carrying signs outside of the bag. No, they might have been doing it elsewhere. And I heard that the negotiations got so heated with the lawyers present that they at one point asked the lawyers to step aside for, and they sat down and got it done. Then I guess yeah. the system went back to having lawyers present. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, so I think right now we're doing a fairly good yeah. job. What was the model before? What was the negotiating team before it was made up of what? Uh, um, well, I don't know how you all did it, but I can tell you, so I, 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 my experience has been from Worcester, so it would be my attorney, uh, the deputy superintendent, um, the, uh, one of, so the structure was a little different, so it would be like an assistant superintendent, it would be uh, the HR person, it would be the finance person from the district in one room, and in another room would be whoever the union invited, their attorney, you know, several members, probably about 15 people, and we would exchange, you know, room to room, we'd exchange some ideas, we would sometimes come together to have a discussion which was really just more speech making really, and then go back to your room. That sounds like a standard approach that most negotiations are to take. Yeah, and, and uh, so I've been through that, and. That's not nearly as productive as what we're doing right now. Right. So historically, um, teachers that were higher on the scale in terms of their compensation often were also people that were highly represented from the union. And I'd like to hear how it's changed in that previously, the focus was more on getting the best salary that you could. And if it meant, mm -hmm laying off teachers that were new, mm -hmm. so be it. Mm -hmm. There was not the um, view that, you know, having less teachers was... Detrimental in some way. Yeah, yeah. so it was more yeah. about getting the best salary that you mm -hmm. could, and if it meant that teachers had to be laid off, then... Yeah. So I'd kind of like to hear how that has changed. It sounds to me like it has changed. Has, yeah, it has a lot. So this document might actually help you out. And I brought, I think, enough for everybody to get one. Great. There you are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't think you've had a district improvement plan before in the district. At least I, I haven't seen one that's been pretty recent. And um, so if you turn just one page in, you'll see this little graphic on this first page. And at the very top, you'll see the district promise, or what we call the vision, and that's about Pentucket becoming the educational opportunity of choice for kids, the employment opportunity of choice for our talented educators, and the investment opportunity for the communities. That's what we focus on in negotiations. So we're all trying to think about how can we make strides, how do we get to this world-class vision? So when we're talking about salaries, I'm as interested in, as, as the teachers are, in bumping up the salaries, but within the context of how are we also the investment opportunity for the community. Mm -hmm. So there's a careful balance there of how much can we, can we uh, improve salaries and also keep within the affordability, the doability of the, of the community. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking in the same kind of way as I am. How did you get that thinking to shift though? Because I don't necessarily feel that that was the balance in the past. I don't know that there was this kind of approach in the past. I think in the past people were competing for money. And when your focus is on money and not some greater value, then you just argue about money. So we never talk about money, you know, to be honest with you. We talk about how do we become these things, and then sometimes money figures into that. Oftentimes it does, like when you're talking about salaries, right? So with any employee group, that's what we really start to talk about. So our issues aren't about money when they come out onto the table. They're about what will it take to get us to this end point. Now over at the left on this document, 
you'll see a description of what the Pentucket student experience would be, what the Pentucket educator experience would be, and the value that we have here in the community. And that sort of guides all of the discussion that we have. So, for instance, in the student descriptor, you'll see a lot about the application of knowledge, adaptive leadership, and, and high levels of personal meaning for every student. We want our kids to really be very good problem solvers and with real world experiences. For teachers, you see, we want educators who are invigorated by leadership opportunities, collaboration, continuous learning. So that's the kind of thing that motivates us in these meetings, not really about arguing over money. So the money part will play out, but I'm as interested as anyone in, in boosting our salaries. I want to compete locally for the best teachers to come to Pentucket, but it has to be within an affordability for the community, and so we all realize that. So these are the kinds of, this is the kind of document that, that, that really guides our discussion. Now, if you don't have this kind of document to guide your discussion, then it really goes to the lowest common denominator, which is things about money or benefits or, like those are important, but that's not going to get you where you want to go. Can, can, can that work within a, um, the limitations of two and a half? Definitely. So last year you saw that I was able to reshape our resources so that we were really fitting within the two and a half percent to the degree that we're able to. Uh, and that's my approach every single year. So the times when I come to you to say, I need more than that, you'll be able to say why, and I'll be able to share with you, here are the reasons why, and then you all can make a decision about it, but you'll know that I'm doing my best to live within my budget. My uh, purpose is to create value for you, not to wring you dry of every dollar. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sure. I, well, so I live here too. <laughs> Dr. McQueen, in order to get to this place, was this piece a collaborative process with the teachers? Yeah. So you see that the column over at the left about the students, the educators, and the community? That took all of last year to develop, and who did I use to develop it? Students, teachers, and community members. So that's all their work. And this top part, when I came to the district, the hiring committee asked me, what will you bring? Why would you be any different than anybody else? That's my part. That's what I was bringing to it. And then from that, you can see here are the strategies that we have in place. These are the high leverage strategies. And then here are all the strategic initiatives. There are 20 priority initiatives that are underway. So we have a very ambitious agenda for the year. But if you turn down into the document, any of these pages, you'll see a calendar of the kinds of things that I'll be doing. So you're able to hold me accountable, just like I hold me accountable, for getting things done. So, you know, you can see from August to June in many of these different areas just what it will take to accomplish those initiatives. And I, uh, I'll, I'll be trying to update that like on a quarterly basis so that everybody can see where we are. And, um, so, you know, it's an, it's an aggressive agenda, but if we don't take an aggressive approach to making improvements, then, you know, it's not really worth it for me. So there are some things already that I'm a little behind on, other things I'm a little ahead on. But Can you remind me what the acronym SMART stands for? Oh, sure. So SMART goals are a current way of ensuring that you have some specific things within so your specific, goal. specific, measurable. Yep, so specific, measurable, actionable, rigorous, and timely. So we, want to know, we don't want you to have this lofty goal that has no time constraints. Or we don't want you to have this goal that's not rigorous. Or we don't want a goal that really there's no action to it, right? Or is not specific. Or that there's no measure. So those are the kinds of things that the district and each teacher actually are, are involved in smart goal formation. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, structure, uh, uh, um, I, I had asked you uh, uh, in an email, um, I have a question about um, you know, 
do we need more students in the district or less? Is there an optimal number of students mm -hmm. to maintain infrastructure or to maintain a high level of mm -hmm. education within the district? I mean, yeah. probably a, a blueprint for the, the model district and what optimal uh, uh, ratios are between yeah. teacher students, uh, revenue uh, uh, sources, yeah. Yeah, uh, ex sure. expenses sure. in the budget. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look at that because I, you know, see like issues at school choice and I say to myself, okay, we, we must not have a high enough population to sustain our own school system if we need to bring in students from other right. districts. Right. And is that the best approach or should we, you know, grow our own students for our own school district? There you go. And, yeah. and that goes to uh, infrastructure of the town and some other planning considerations of yeah. whether or not we should be a bigger or a smaller town. Yeah. If we're going to maintain status quo, and we cannot meet that minimal, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, there's economy of scale, and whether it be schools or business right. or, or anything uh, that you consider. Mm -hmm. um, so, can you address oh, that sure. issue for me and shed mm -hmm. some light on it? So, if you go back to this uh, page again, the graphic page, and if you look down at number 15 on the initiative side, we're trying to manage class sizes at or below 20 to 1. Now, we're not there yet, and the elementary level, we're about 23 or below, you know, so 18 to 23 students per class. That's very good. That's very competitive, but we'd really like to be at a 20 to 1 ratio, 20 students to 1 teacher or below. And so why did I pick that number? Why is that important? Because that would be very competitive in parents' minds. Parents are looking for that highly personalized <coughs> educational experience for their students. So rather than thinking about how can we get economy of scale by putting more kids in the classroom to get as much out of it as we can, that approach will actually drive down the value for your schools and drive down the, the interest in your schools. So if we want people to be moving here or have a higher property value, higher interest, that's the kind of thing that will attract them to your district. So uh, I think uh, there is a point of view about how do you get as much money out of your classroom as possible. That's what brought us to having an over-reliance on the school choice. So if you have 25 kids in the room and you have three extra seats in there that you could push another three kids in, then we take in three more school choice kids and put them in there. And we get $15,000, $5,000 so for each student, right? Well, that's a short-sighted point of view because no parent wants 28 kids in their, their, their child's classroom. So that will actually drive parents away from you in the community. And that will, and on the other hand, you'll be putting kids in that don't live in the community. So you become kind of a resource to other communities and not your own. So in my point of view, we're trying to bring the property values up and, dr and bring more interest into the community for the kinds of quality that we offer. So I think there has been a shift in that right now, and uh, my office is experiencing a high volume of calls from parents in other communities wondering, how can I get my child into Pentucket? And my, my response has been, well, the best way is to just move here. You know, so if you buy a house, <coughs> then your children can come here. But um, so far this year, we, we aren't accepting new elementary school choice students, and I've been really focused on if we have a choice opening, having it over at the secondary level where the student will be exiting a little bit faster than taking 13 years. So um, that's generated a benefit, I think, for the community in the sense that houses are selling at a, a pretty good rate, but it's also sort of a, a two-edged sword. So I've got choice students moving into the community, and so when they do that, they are no longer a choice student. So my choice enrollments are dropping pretty quickly because they're moving here. <laughs> so now I've got to think about how do I slow down the, the, um, the choice student drop. I've got to slow that down because we are into that for about $800,000. And I can't afford to have it just plummet down, you know, where people move here. Can you, what does that mean, we are into it for $800,000? We have an, our, our, our foundation, our budget, is overly dependent on choice students. I see. The over-dependence is because we, we currently have about $800,000 of 
choice money in our district. So we're dependent on that. Choice money should actually be used as supplemental money. It should be, here's your foundation budget, and the choice money is in addition to that. So we should be getting extra things, not the basics. But if you, if you contrast that figure with special education costs, mm -hmm. which sometimes go hand in hand with choice, well, I don't know that that's true. How do you, what do you mean? I mean that sometimes choice students come in and they cost more than the $5,000. So it can happen. So if that happens, is there, is there a savings in another area that does any compensation for <coughs> 800000 if, if a student leaves? That would be more, more expense on our part, right? So the $800,000, is, is, you can think of it as going into salaries because that's our biggest line item, right? So if I were to take out $800,000 from our budget, like I don't know how I would pay for things because that's how dependent we are on it right now. But, I'm but I guess what I'm saying is that if some of those students that are mm -hmm. within, that are providing some of those monies yep, okay. are students that are receiving SPED services yeah. that are costing more than that. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then we would contribute more or the sending community... No, we would. might benefit more. So if somebody... I'm not sure how we would benefit more. <coughs> well, probably, I guess because they're already here, but sometimes, I mean, the special education piece is not a factor when there's a choice student, correct? No. That question can't even be asked. It can't be asked, right. So it may be that sometimes, historically, there has been a maybe... I don't know how many choice, there's like 200? Oh, uh, just under. So uh, we were at 187. We are currently around 161. Okay. So if of that number, some of those contribute to the SPED costs, eventually, is it possible that we may see a reduction in SPED? You don't think there'll be a corollary? No, they don't. There's not a reduction. in if there's a special education need, there's not some benefit that we get to reduce special education funding. I don't think I'm... There's no additional my, funding. I don't think I'm expressing myself well. Right. What, what I'm saying is, do you think that in the end, by not accepting more choice students, yeah. our SPED budget may Could be go down. reduced? Yes. Oh, I don't think significantly. <laughs> I don't think there's a, a heavy correlation between the students who are coming to us and, and having special needs. Because there's a huge... Uh, Kentucky as a whole, historically, has had an excellent reputation for being a place that provides, you know, um, special needs. exceptional, exceptional education. for children uh, who have special needs. Well, I, I don't think <laughs> that's true either. So there may be a reputation for it, but right now what I'm seeing is there's a, a big need in our special education service delivery. So uh, we may have some good things going. I don't, I don't argue that point. But when I think about what we're offering and what we should be offering, for our special education students, uh, there's still a gap. So I think we have some improvements. And if you were to look down here, um, number 16 is strengthen the delivery of special education services. We have some real needs there right now. Uh, so I think we do some things that are very good, but I think we could do a whole lot better. You know, and a lot of that also means to keep some of that in-house. In other words, deliver in-house instead That's of right. uh, there are special ed, uh, special needs children that That's we right. can't accommodate. The better we do, the more we can retain our retain. students. Exactly right. Is this 20 to 1 ratio, uh, is that across the board study, kindergarten up to 12th grade? Ideally. So right now we have about a 23 or under number for the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. uh, middle school, we have some areas that are very high. Uh, language art, um, not language arts, uh, languages like Spanish, <laughs> German, Latin can have up to 30 students in them, uh, but those are those are uh, only in some areas, not across the board. So what I'm thinking is that in grades 11 and 12, is it that important to have an exact 20 to 1? Uh, one or two years from now, those kids will be off someplace in an amphitheater of 100 students. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the research says that at that grade level, mm -hmm. there's not as significant of an impact. At the lower level, yeah, that's, what, that's what I'm drawing. The, yeah. the, the ratio is much more important. There's a lot of variability at the high school. So you might have some classes that are small, you might have some other classes that are large, and you would experience that in college You know when you go mm -hmm. there too. So I think... The, this is primarily my focus at the elementary level, but it won't hurt if we have 
uh, low class mm -hmm. sizes, you know, in other areas as well. And I think at the high school, it, it remains important because a lot of students are going to private schools that have a lower ratio. So I think whether it's a, you know, um, whether it actually improves performance or not, there's a perception mm -hmm. that having mm -hmm. that lower number is a good thing, right? Yeah. It, is back to uh, the, the school choice. You, there's still, you're still accepting students at, at high school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that because some of the students go to Whittier or uh, seek al al alternate education, or is there a, we don't have enough students at the high school? Cause, no. Because, again, in terms of structure, yeah. you know, I, I, I talk to people like everyone else who yeah. say, oh, we might need a new high school, or it's not big enough. Well, and I say to myself, well, it might be big enough if we didn't have students in there from Haverhill, and so yeah. should we spend money on infrastructure and expand the mm -hmm. the box to accommodate kids outside right. the district? Where maybe we ought to say, well, maybe we'll reduce the number of classrooms, reduce mm -hmm. the number of teachers, mm -hmm. and just service the people within the district and within the yeah. within the tax base. So, so the reason that we can accept students at the high school level easier than at the elementary is that the scheduling is a whole lot different at that level. So you might have, there's a lot of variability. So by virtue of signing up for different classes, rather than having a class of fourth graders, you, uh, we're able to fit kids in in a whole lot different way. Um, and then when you think about the infrastructure of the high school, uh, whether or not we have a large number of students there, the infrastructure is crumbling. I mean, it's just too old. So we've got to do something there to fix it, whether we uh, accept choice students or not. And it's not a matter of, uh, it's not an argument about do we have too many students at the high school, it's does the high school uh, still uh, help us to get to where we want to go educationally? And that's what, what the real question is. So we may have some population you know, needs at, that, at the high school level, but it's more about does the high school actually deliver what we need it to? So if we're thinking about some innovative practices and the high school's unable to deliver, then that's a need, or even if the structure is crumbling in some way, that's Physically. physically that's a need, exactly. Can you, but, but in planning the next step, or the next building, or the next... Yeah, you yeah know, so you want to think about, do we want to continue to have that number of choice students, or will we be able to reduce? I think we can still reduce, mm -hmm. and I think that will be a, a help to us, but the, the physical plant also needs to be tuned up. A couple of questions I have. Um, going back to the the budget, about eighty percent is uh, salaries. Is it more than that? No, I think it's more in the seventies. Seventies, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now the biggest driver of that component is what is baked into the contract, the teacher's contract. And the teacher's contract is for three years, correct? Uh, typically. Typically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we, of course, are blessed with a superintendent who really does not want to approach the towns for operating money. That's really what That's right. you're saying. You, yeah. you, 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 you want to operate within your means with what, what, what we, we can deliver as, right. a, as a system. Now, therefore, uh, from a, as, a, as a Board of Selectmen member, I need to answer to taxpayers. And a lot of my discussions, unfortunately, with taxpayers yeah. is about a 30 to 60 second elevator yeah. discussion. Yeah. And people want to know what's going on with the budget, and the yeah. answer, I, I, there's, the answer is either A, there's no override, or B, there is an override. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's been my experience. For six years I was on the school committee, yeah. five of those years there was an override. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the interest space negotiators, which is composed yeah. of the superintendent, the business manager, and the union reps, yeah. that's good. Mm -hmm. But what happens if someday you need to go outside the box? You need more than two and a half percent. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't uh, I be playing the devil's advocate and suggest that maybe there would be some criticism because now this closed group has decided that we need a lot more than two and a half percent and you just come out and deliver that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, so how, what would happen in that situation? So here's the, the part that I didn't hear about, Joe, when you were mm -hmm. just describing that. Mm -hmm. That uh, contract is not really at the crux of where the problem is. So um, I'm committed to the 2.5%, and I believe our unions are committed to that too.
but there's a there's an agent at large that's not committed to two and a half percent that has a big impact on you and each town, and that's the state. So the state's part of our budget has been flat for a long time, and I can't depend upon that increasing two and a half percent even. So when I have sixteen million dollars that doesn't increase, that's a big chunk of my money. So if you think about the total amount of my money, when half of that money is flat, I can't count on 2.5% each year. And that's where the state has been shifting the burden back to the town to right. fund. So I may be within my 2.5%, but my budget doesn't always look like it because I can't absorb the 2.5% per year. That's a losing proposition. So that is being shifted to each town and that's where you feel the real rub. So I think the elevator speech is more about why is the state um, not meeting the same level of obligation that I'm as a superintendent or that you're willing to do as a town? Why aren't they operating at the proposition two and a half level? You know, where we're expecting a two and a half percent increase. If that were the case, like you wouldn't be hearing a lot of trouble from me each year. But it's a losing proposition because I keep having to absorb that in order to meet your needs and demand that I live within my means. My means are always diminishing because of the state. Is it a situation where the state mandates a program, funds it for a while, and then pulls the funding and expects the towns to fill well, the gap? Well, you don't feel it quite in that same way, but um, I can give you t uh, lots of examples of un these unfunded mandates. So one of them is is called this new system for MCAS that's coming in, PARC, right? P-A-R-C-C -C is the acronym. So PARC is a new demand from the state that we test all of our students using a computer. Okay, so no more paper, paper and pencil. Every student's gonna be tested on the computer. Well, that means my infrastructure isn't currently able to support it. That means I don't have enough computers to support it, and I don't have enough people to support the computers that I don't have. So the whole system is being pushed on to me to fund, or to you, when in fact it, it's just another demand. It's, it's not that I'm getting any support. Well, that's a two-year program? They're going to try it for two years? And did our district get chosen for it? Well, uh, many of the school districts have at least some of their schools that will be piloting that in this coming year. Okay. And their intention is to roll this out over the course of the next two years. Okay. So right now, they're testing... They're uh, assessing the district's capability to implement it. Well, I can tell you that Pentucket is not different from many districts, and, and we're not there yet. Yeah. So I can't imagine the burden, the financial burden that's about to hit us with all this other stuff that's coming out there. Let so me talk to you also about the, about the last uh, area that I'd like to question you on, if you, if you could help us understand. Sure. Um, with four children going through the system, I've experienced 11 years of a crumbling plant, the high school. Yeah. It was crumbling 11 years ago. I can't imagine it's still crumbling. Yeah. So we need a new high school. Well, I, I don't know about new, but okay. we need something. Something. Then. We need yeah. something. Renovated. Renovated. Give us a little bit about what would be the process. How would the Board of Selectmen, the Finance Committee of this town, how would we be involved in that process? I would, and I, I don't mean to be critical, but I yeah. would think that that interest space group is going to look different than the interest space group you have for teachers' contracts, mm -hmm. because that's a big ticket. It is a big ticket. So, what I'm about to do is to form a group uh, com uh, composed of members from each town that will come together and actually make a decision, new or renovation because we can't have that discussion as we move forward. We've got to settle that part out. I, I'm a strong proponent for renovation. I don't see that we can afford or that we actually need a brand new school. But that's something that, that I can't afford to have as a conversation later in the process. I need to have that conversation in the beginning part. Once we have uh, uh, agreement about what we want, then I can put forward a plan to MSBA. And the MSBA is not just about the physical plant. And the MSBA is the state agency that will help us with the renovation or the new building, right? So when I move forward there, their interest is in what's the physical condition of the school? 
And does that physical, does that physical plant, does the school actually help you accomplish your educational goals? So those are the two parts. So when you look across the state at the physical plant that we have, we're not in all that terrible shape. So as bad as it seems, there are communities that actually have crumbling buildings. I mean, we describe it a little dramatically as though it's crumbling down, but the, if you go to some communities, their schools are literally crumbling down in front of them. And the state has a priority list of who to go to first. So we're not the worst, but we get some problems, right? The, the part that I'd like to make the case for is our building doesn't really suit our purpose anymore, that we're not able to meet our educational needs for our students anymore. So in my plan here, you see work about innovation schools, you see things about high-powered uh, experiences for students. Um, I just came from an innovation school meeting in uh, Malden tonight. And when we start to go down that track and we show, here's our building from the 50s or 60s, and here's our 2015 point of view about where we want to go, they don't match. And that will actually, I think, make a better case for us. So yes, we have some problems physically, but no, it doesn't really meet our needs. And that will help us to generate some <clears throat> momentum. Now, another good part about Pentucket is each community has taken care of their elementary schools. Right now, we are in a MSBA project, a small one, for the middle school. And MSBA is interested in having one focus, one target, not several. So we have now eliminated every other focus, and now the high school is the next big project. So I think we are well positioned to take that next step. So um, in the near future, I'll be convening, I'll be asking for folks to convene to really argue out and settle on renovation or new. And once we have that done, we can move. We, it's important that we have it settled up because if we don't move smoothly through this process, if the state sees that we're still arguing things out, yeah, they won't touch it. So this group will be the stakeholders. It'll be school committee members, teachers, administrators. Community members. Community yeah. members, perhaps. Probably a select them. Okay. Is, is there any... <clears throat> Go ahead, Lisa. Um, so how will... Is that just going to be a discussion? Because to me, there's a piece of that that, you know, somebody who's an engineer needs, needs to look at that building and say, well, is this really viable to do a renovation? Or... Are there certain things that can be renovated? Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. And it will be important for that team, once they decide renovate or new, because that, that may not be just such a technical structural issue as what do we all feel we can afford and what do we all feel we can do. That may be at the, the crux of the discussion. Then the next part will be to have each town um, agree to have an initial assessment done of the building. We can't do the official one because MSBA has to do that. But we can do some initial work, and that will also make our case for whatever we, we have as a point so of view. MSBA does not prohibit you from doing that in advance? Because the, some of the library is doing some of this, and, and, and that yeah. grant process prohibits it. Yeah, we can do some of our early assessment work. That, that will be for us to decide to do, and that will help us to make a case for what we want to do. Doug, you were on a committee, because I mentioned I was for a while on the same committee. Yeah, Didn't they do kind of an assessment back four or five years ago of the, the schools? And wasn't there even an approach to the MSBA? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, we... Um, about renovations? The first, first part was similar to what this committee would do. We looked mm -hmm. at the schools, um, see how many kids are in it, how many kids are projected to be in it, mm -hmm. the size of the classrooms, mm -hmm. the size of all the, the amount of classrooms, the bathrooms, mm -hmm. and see just like this community is going to do. Is it a building worth adding on to, or do we start from ground zero? Mm -hmm. And our committee decided to add on to that building mm -hmm. because the base, the core of the building was still mm -hmm. functioning well for our needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Is there any uh, reason for that to change, that, except for the fact they're all five years older? Uh, well, you're talking at the high school. Now. Didn't the high school get get assessed? No. no uh, well, well, there was a previous committee. Yeah, back in 07, 08, there was. John Osborne was on yeah, it. I, and, uh, was I was on. not on that committee, oh, so I don't know what they followed through with. I was on that committee. Yeah. 
Well, you could probably answer that. Well, yeah, that just very briefly, we went through a formal process in order to decline because we weren't a top priority. Did yeah, you but, have an engineering study done? Yeah, we building? did. We did. And, you know, but the district was in disarray, too. We had not green projected the, mm -hmm. the, the, the elementary schools. They were still infighting whether it should be uh, Bagnall versus Page versus the high school. So now we got that all cleaned up. All yeah. the schools have been green projected. A green yeah. project type program is completing at the yeah. middle school. Yeah. So now it's all, now everybody agrees it's the high school. It's a good time. And, uh, and so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, now is now a good time to, right. to, to, to drive that. We need to drive it. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Dr. McLean, could you go? Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I wanted to go back to the uh, budget uh, uh, revenue sources. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unpredictable, uh, the state uh, uh, funding. That's what I heard from you pretty much. Is, is What is the timing of when you know what you're going to get, uh, and how does that re relate to the timing of when you form the budget? And, yeah, it, so and, and, and if, if that is a problem, do you level fund based on last year's? Uh, revenue and then you know it, it doesn't seem you know if you already know the uh, that you, you won't get two and a half percent it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to me to move move all the all the numbers up two and a half percent and all that you know it falls short so right so uh, uh, we won't know until the governor governor's budget comes out and so probably February is at the end of January is when he does that and then we'll know by the end of January February what those numbers are but we can't, um, we can't depend upon an increase right now. So that's a real hard part for us. So revenue sources are also down for us. Can you hold the budget up until you get the answer? So. No, I can't. I've got to move forward because by April, I've got to have uh, uh, that adopted by the school committee, <coughs> and then that has to come to the town. So essentially, you count check-ins that haven't hatched. I mean, that's the, the yeah. system we have in place. Yeah, and we do have some revenue shortfalls right now as school choice. As that diminishes, uh, we've lost about 10% of our students in this first year. So I was predicting that we could cut back about 5% per year. So because they're moving into the district, I've already got a 10% decrease. So I've already gone beyond where I thought I could go. So that's a shortfall for me right now. And we've got a couple of other areas that, you know, are playing out. So, you know, we'll see how we can manage it. Uh, I'm always a person who thinks about how to reshape my resources to meet my goals. Mm -hmm. So you may see that, uh, you know, I, I make another shift administratively to reduce my administrative costs to the degree that I can. Mm -hmm. I took a, a big change last year in making a shift, and uh, I think I still have a little wiggle room there. But my real objective is to keep teachers in the classroom, uh, make sure I have uh, class sizes that are still attractive to parents and to, um, you know, to generate as much value as I can for the district with what I've got. Dr. McQueen, you referenced earlier some limitations with respect to innovative, innovate, innovative practices. Could you be a little bit more specific about what you view as the limitations right now with, with what we currently have? You mean at the high school? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, we have uh, three innovation schools that are currently being developed, or pro uh, the proposal for them are developed. They're due tomorrow, so I can better speak about it tomorrow when they come in. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have one for movement, science, and athletics. We have one for uh, the arts and, and visual effects. We have one for uh, safety and public service. Um, and each of these different areas uh, has some needs that currently our traditional comprehensive high school wouldn't really be able to match, you know, in a lot of respects. So these are the types of services that you might find more traditionally at like a vocational type? Is, is that what you're talking about, is adding something? No, it's, it's not so much vocational <laughs> as it is just more contemporary learning. So we're trying to match what we do to the interests of the students and to the, the function of producing career readiness as well, college and career readiness. So, um, Does it change the core? Uh, it can to some degree, but the core, uh, the English classes, the social studies, the content may shift a little bit, but the courses probably won't. So we're obligated still to the mass core, which is the number of, <coughs> of core courses that you have to take in high school. But it would shift the kinds of extra things that you could take 
the students are looking to go very deep into a content area. So each of those content areas would represent a deep uh, level of experience. And uh, you know, a traditional <coughs> comprehensive high school gives you kind of a surface level of a lot of things, but not really depth. Mm -hmm. So we've got to develop some depth, and that's where our building falls short for us. So how do you see these fitting into, or what modifications do you see the building requiring in order to meet the needs of something like this? Well, I think a lot of those questions are, you know, need to be answered as we, as we make progress, but I can give you some ideas. Like for movement, science, and athletics, do we have a community center where uh, various uh, constituents in the, in the population in our communities come and actually can get training services by our students? See? Um, are there exercise centers? Are there health and wellness centers where um, even elderly folks could come and receive services uh, from some pretty expert people here in our schools? Mm -hmm. um, are there uh, career opportunities that we could link to, for instance, in the arts and visual effects? So we've developed a partnership with a school called Noman out in Hollywood, and uh, that partnership would allow our students access to some pretty high-powered internships, summer uh, school programming, uh, virtual uh, classes, and uh, a kind of a pathway, a pipeline into the career for uh, animation, uh, uh, gaming, uh, video, uh, film, all those kinds of things. So, um, what's fascinating about the innovation school concept is it. As a budget item, it doesn't cost much more because you're really you're, you're what you're doing is you're leveraging relationships and other That's resources. Right. With, we're trading things, or you know, we, we right. our kids can gain access to a school in California, and those kids can gain <clears throat> access to something yeah. we have that that's right. unique to us. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit of a specialized training with some very motivated yeah. and capable teachers. And with the safety and public service, our local police and fire departments are contributing to that. So we have students who will be you know, doing um, uh, some internship work and partnerships with um, our local uh, police and fire departments on safety and public service. And so we don't have to go to the West Coast for that. Right. And we've got great expertise right here. So that would be an example of how we grow our own uh, public service folks and how we get better at, at what we do too, you know, here in the community. It's community development that we're really interested in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Anybody else have any questions? That's okay, so my heart. We, <laughs> <laughs> we're a little bit over, but I uh, respect the fact that you haven't been home yet. So I uh, haven't. We appreciate you coming. All right. We really do. Very thank you. Thank you. Role resident, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so I can just walk next door and be home. <laughs> thank you. That's good. Okay, Dan, nice to see thank you again. You. Thanks, nice everybody. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to stick around if you want to. We're going to do some advanced. Do you have more questions for the committee members? I don't know if you want to add anything. You know, I just, uh, just want to get you. Well, you've seen what our superintendent is all about, what he brings to the table. It seems fantastic. Uh, so this far. plan that he put together is extremely ambitious. I joined the school committee myself because I was extremely upset. How, how long have you been on the school committee? Uh, I've been up in two years. Okay, okay. sorry. I don't know the history. Um, the previous administration. No, you can go there. Oh, you go there. I like history. Uh, you know it. <laughs> oh, I know it all too well, unfortunately. Okay, well, then well, I'm, I'm basically. I need to know. Oh, yeah, these guys I'm, I'm a newbie to town, so you know. Well, like me. We were spending an awful lot of money on litigation. Yeah. And we had a much stronger superintendent. Oh, well, boy, he's got to eat toe. You know. you say stronger? Well, <laughs> He, led, well, he, he had <laughs> different, a different approach. I think right. My view is it was confrontation. Yeah, because I don't think stronger is... That's a very good word. Instead of a good customer service. That's and it mean. always ended up by this district in these towns writing checks. Mm -hmm. I call it antagonistic. Yeah. So, uh, so you got involved and... That's why I'm... You solved all those I problems. <laughs> so we're very lucky to have this gentleman come to this. Uh, community, and it's always our fear that someday we may not be able to retain him. Whereas other school districts are going to reach out and say, You know, I like what Kentucky has. How can we get that? <laughs> yeah. 
So that's something that may need to be considered. Yeah. Um, I assure you that our attorney's fees are extremely low right now. I'm not going to share figures with you, but right. you people are saving a lot of money. And is so that... Like to hear? There's one case pending, mm -hmm. and it's a throwback from the last administration. Mm -hmm. So the school committee has done very well to remove a lot of... Uh, where was that money coming from, though? Is that coming from the town? That cost, so, that cost your teachers. That okay, so that's what. So that sport. money that you're saving there can actually be put back that, into the budget. Right. Okay. Go to education instead of attorneys. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, we used to have a much heavier administration. We used to have an assistant superintendent. We used to have two directors for the special eds, one for um, in school and one that handled out of district. We've combined them into one person. Uh, every department that he oversees has been reviewed. Changes have been made. One person may be shifted to a half a person for this department and a half a person for the next department. See principals handling two schools. Yeah, what it's about, an yeah. extremely lean administration. What about assistant principals or anything? Principals, can they be shared? <laughs> There's actually work come, that he's he's uh, bringing forward on that, so I, I don't want to. That's probably something. Well, they're next year, the principal now. Yeah. Right. But assistant Don principal, Hill's a lot of their work so now is, yeah, is dealing with right you know, <laughs> compliance with special ed needs. And Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's a different um, function. Yeah. If you were to look at the old it's not administration, of task yeah. in, in this administration, you will save a tremendous amount of money. But that money's the being put back in into our those. communities are actually getting a lot more service. Phones are being answered. You know, they're being told, let's let's sit down and let's discuss it and let's find out what we could do and what your needs are. It's no longer get you, call your attorney. So it's good. That's positive. Uh, we've come a long way. What about um, a fee sharing uh, between the? Um the towns in the district. I mean, how is that formula? Is there a form? Uh, it must be a formula. Right? There is a formula. And, and is that and form that's, that's run by, uh, as I believe, it's it's done through the state. The state yeah. decides how many kids are going through. It's based on census. Yes, how many kids are going to your school from this town and that's that also town. Per capita income. Too, so it's right. right. Oh, it factors in income. It's not just you, pupils. You, it's you, not just pupils. I would I would forward these questions to um, the business manager. Yeah, it's not just pupils. So no. As a school committee member, I, is it something we don't all get into that depth. Mm -hmm. these, when a problem arises, it's our job to resolve it. Okay. The public brings out the problem that and you, you present know, it. They feel the that they're not being serviced well enough. Okay. We sit down, discuss it, we resolve it. So you're like a customer service department. And they're so far and few right now. It's almost. It's not the well, same. Well, the fact that he's so, been in one grievance, he hasn't had any grievance. It's unbelievable. So I should start coming to the committee. Uh, every you know, uh, every meeting, so. Joe will tell you, every meeting ended in executive session and you were hearing about this case or that case or this. Yeah, there were quite a few. I was on the grievance. I mean, I, I sat right. on, um, of seven, six years I was on the school committee, I was on the grievance committee, subcommittee throughout that period. I think I, I went through 22 sessions. Isn't it amazing? Are the meetings shorter? Sessions, much shorter? We, we haven't done speak. one. Twice so, yeah. I read on yeah. the old administration. So, so the approach, to even money grievances, we need the black hole. Absolutely. What, what, well, let me just say the grievances that we heard at the school committee were those that were raised to the level of the school committee. Mm -hmm. but that, that's got to reach a certain level, right? Yeah. Level three? That's what I mean. Yeah, so level ones and twos. So I know of 20 something, yeah. and those are the ones that came to level three. So. It's a different administration, and uh, it, it, for sure, uh, our our town is our towns are well served by the current administration. Tell tell me a little bit, and you and Lisa, um, uh, your role on the school committee. Um, well, I can tell you, we yeah. everybody. How does it feel to be on the school committee? I mean, you, do you get do you feel you get support connection with the board of selectmen? Is there areas of improvement? Um, that I don't should be looking. At? I don't have a lot of communication with the board of selectmen. Okay. But I, I feel uh, with my work, especially with the building 
committee that yeah. uh, the business manager um, did an excellent job, fantastic communication, who brought everything we were discussing and doing to the Board of Selectmen. So, but uh, as a school committee member, they really, unless it's a budgetary meeting and we show up in case there's any uh, questions you may have for us. But other than that, I, I view my role is I want to see parity if something's going on in, in the school and I want to make sure Groveland gets their mm -hmm. representation on it. Um, we all have different things that we personally bring to it. Um, you know, we, I would say, you know, things that affect me or I look out for are different from things that Lisa may look out for. And, uh, well, you advocate along different lines. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Certain passions that you have. Yeah. Yep. We so, haven't heard from Lisa. Would you like to chime in? Absolutely. I'm the newest member to the school committee. Um, I actually took Joe's new, position. New people have a voice, too. I do have a voice. <laughs> I have a voice, too. There you go. <laughs> yes. Do you want to add anything to our committee agenda um, this evening? I think I'm very happy that Dr. Mulquin is here now. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been a tremendous... Um, change like you know it discussed you know how does this year come into play um it works it, it, it's exciting to people it's something new it's positive and people want to be part of it the uh, teachers union and the teachers have a lot of respect for the administration they sit down it's it's a good flow of communication it's no longer us and them we receive this through the principals, through teachers, through the um, different departments. It's usually good news what we're hearing. So, power. so, so we're well represented in that, in terms of the taxpayers and the, and yeah, the uh, residents. So you know, uh, if getting best my phone was ringing off the hook, I'd second question some of my decisions, but it, it hasn't. And um, and prior to this. The morale was pretty poor. Very poor. And where would you say it is now? Is it like, is it is it repaired and it's back where it, is it where it came? I would say it's almost renewed. Yeah, there was the a word I would use. You know, <laughs> Roland has come through. You know, we have the transition of you know just the bridge and the Bagel School and the work going on in town. Well, it's almost the same with the school. It's all new again. It's fresh again. And you know, we're very very lucky that we have this team of people working together. There, there was a survey, I think, two or three years ago that was sent out by the state to every school district in the state. A series of questions, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, strongly agree. And in one school, 70% uh, of the faculty strongly disagreed or disagreed that there was an atmosphere of trust and respect in the school. Oh, yeah. And I think that was probably not wow. just that one school. I think it was throughout the whole. I'd be interested to see what it would be today. Because it, oh, I think it's a lot better. It, it was. <laughs> I described it as being a caustic atmosphere. It was yeah. very harsh. And um, now it's when I'm greeted in stores or if I go to business school, they're, they're just so nice. They, they appreciate the fact that we listen to them. We do what we can do to help them out. It's not about us trying to make them do anything. It's for the better good of the community and the, uh, the schools. Absolutely. And that was well, that builds trust, doesn't it? That's that was a, such a huge thing. Out there. And you know, we, we used to go before the school committee and request things, and because of who was in Never charge happened. and the way they were in charge, you weren't going to get well, those answers. Well, I remember one incident I read in the paper, and I think. This was before you were on the school committee. You asked for certain documentation. Mm. They said, send a freedom of information request. And then re the response was like, it's privilege. Yeah, and the funny thing was, he, he called me up right in front of the school committee and said, I got your information for you. <laughs> OK, and he gave me an envelope. I get home, I open up, there was nothing in it. <laughs> I mean, I look oh at, my god! I look at things yeah. like. I mean, so, 
Well, that's what. Who does that person work for? Right. Yeah, I don't think he's working. We, right now. We're paying this person to do this to us. Well, I mean, yeah. a lot of changes have come down the pike. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's uh, horrible. I would look at that as insubordination. <laughs> well, that's good. Joe can enlighten you more. Yeah, right. I certainly can. Well, we could go can all yeah, uh, yeah. day and all night. Uh, uh, I'm we're probably we're the so hardest one on the committee. If Doc, don't look back, look forward. Yeah. And you really need to look forward to see the blessings. This community is safe. Well, I hope we get the call when it's time to build that high school. I'd like to be part of that process. I think that. Do you want to do the roofing or the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the masonry work? The yeah. windows, yeah. There's, there's, um, it's ideas. a good time right now yeah. because all the communities are right. They've all come through a, a fresh project. That's uh, so everybody in the town knows what it's about, they know the work they signed up for. And it's not like, you know, there's no surprises. We all know what the process is. It's in their mind. It's a good time to rally these people together and see what we can do. Well, we can't um, convince uh, the taxpayers to put the bill for a very expensive high school unless we really have participation. Board of Selectmen, directors of finance, FinCom people, mm -hmm. community leaders. I mean, we really need to have a lot of input because it has to be a community decision. Community decision, a lot of transparency. Yeah. These people need to get the answers to their questions and yeah. not be you know, told don't worry about it. They need to have factual answers. One of the hardest, now being on the Bagnell Committee, one of the hardest things that was for us is to get this information out to the public. Nobody gets a standard paper anymore or one or two papers. Most people don't get the newspaper anymore. They shouldn't. It's terrible. Right. And <laughs> it, it's, it, my articles. it's just <laughs> impossible <laughs> to get <laughs> this information out <laughs> to them. It's like the car They print lies. Well, it's yeah. true, but not to have something show up where they can look, oh, look, they want to build a new school. They want, they want some input. They want some right. support. You guys did a good job on that. They the don't project. get that. And, you know, then, so you rely on people like Joe with Facebook and... Although when he sent out that year in review this year, I sent it to people in my neighborhood that didn't have children because I wanted them to see a good idea. kind of what was going on, that there was really positive things happening. Um, one of the things that the superintendent's working for is it's going to be to get the communities involved more with the schools, and I think that's... Although he mentioned that, you know, going forward some of it. But Groland, as Projects, it stands now, programs. look look what we have for the community for the next time we have shows going on, or you know. We've had a lot of wonderful improvements. In Absolutely, in, short time. Well, in a very short time. As long as we don't spend all the money on land, we should be able to afford the high school. Well, let's stick on to stay on the all right, we'll, topic here. We're, we're <laughs> Thank you, Lisa and Doug. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Good job. And um, if you guys have concerns, contact us. Yeah. We're not going to hit, you know, we got to hear it from somebody first before we Are your email anything. addresses on the? Yes, they are. Okay. They're all on the, uh, the school website okay. and uh, even our home phone numbers. So get in touch with us, share your concerns. That's the only way we're going to know there's a problem. Thanks, Dad. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. All right, we're going to quickly wrap up. I hope uh, pushing the uh, eight thirty hour. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Michelle, could you comment on the uh, status of the minutes from the last meeting? I'm still working on them. I'm sorry. Uh, I have them 95%. I have some information yeah. from Kathy. Thank you for reminding me. Kathy called me today. She owes us another set of minutes. And yes. She said she had some issues with uh, her computer and she will be delivering those to us. All right, I think the September one she sent out at yeah. some point, so I don't know if those were the final. Yeah, no, or... there's another set she has. Okay. Yeah, she we, can, we can act on those at the next Yeah, she's going to send yeah. them. She had a problem with the computer and she just got it fixed this week and she hopes to get them out probably by, hopefully maybe over the weekend she'll get them out to you at the end. Okay, and we'll bring them up uh, yeah, next time around. Yeah. Uh, 
same thing with the survey, or is that uh, ready to be discussed? Do we? I made the corrections. I don't know if people want a copy, or if, I, if they don't want me to just hand it out around. Well, should we disseminate those either now or through email, and then next time we bring that to the table? Is yeah, that uh, given us? Send it through email. We'll have time to review. Yeah, I can scan it and send it. But as far as you're concerned, it's a final format, and uh, I don't mind taking a hard copy now if you don't mind. You know, I can copy it right there. It's not in the final form. I just made the, okay. the corrections, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure that everybody wants I'll it that it. way. All right. Yeah. Did we want to discuss that now? Do we have time? Or? <laughs> it's just mostly grammatical. Oh, okay. I thought we were good to go with it the last time around, and it was just you had questioned some uh, verbiage. Or yeah. Or the, uh, the only thing that I would raise and ask people to maybe potentially reconsider, I think it should be online. I think the idea of having to write it, bring it to a box, and put it in a box. I think that the technology that we have today gives you more anonymity than that. Mm -hmm. that's well, idea. that's, a, like good survey idea. that's a good idea. But we'll see whether or not the Florida uh, Selectman will uh, <laughs> entertain that. Uh, could I ask uh, Betty and Joe what's the status of the, uh, the uh, recommendations that we forwarded? <laughs> set of recommendations were uh, part of the correspondence to our last meeting on Monday and the, the, the chair um, guided the board not to specifically approve the recommendations so they remain within the context of our charge remember what our charge says is to study government and, and basically report to the board of selectmen so the board of selectmen is probably not going to specifically look at these recommendations and approve them. I think... Uh, but they, they, they looked at them and they make a mental note of it? Is that kind of... Well, I, I, think we're what, really I think what will happen is I think people watching these meetings and the discussion that we're probably going to have, we're going to still be talking about some of these recommendations over time. I, I think what will happen, other boards will be encouraged to implement some of this without specifically being told by anyone, certainly by the Board of Selectmen, to do that. Like, for example, the word is out, based on the work that we've done, that the master plan should possibly be considered. And so I am very sure that the planning board is probably going to look at that. And that's a result of our work. And we brought that out. We invited people from the planning board. We had that discussion. So they're not waiting, nor do they need approval from the Board of Selectmen for them to have a meeting and begin discussing the uh, master plan. The word is out also about the zoning bylaws. The zoning bylaws is another recommendation that we made. I don't think the zoning, uh, 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 the ZBA or the planning board needs to get um, the Board of Selectmen to approve that recommendation. I think they're just going to take the ball and run with it, and I believe that there's going to be uh, some action in the next several weeks, the next several months, where either either the ZBA or the planning board <coughs> will probably take a look at that and consider maybe reviewing the uh, zoning bylaw. So our recommendations are going to come through uh, just by uh, advocacy, just by people uh, you know taking interest in what we've done. Uh, but I do not believe that the board of selectmen is going to specifically approve any of our recommendations, uh, taking them and then you know voting on them whether they. You know, this one we should rec this recommendation we should approve well, there this is, one we're not. I think there are a few though that we're requesting that, particularly the posting of minutes and that type of thing. Well, if that is the case, then what the board should, what this committee should do, is specifically ask for a vote on specific recommendations. Okay. Like for example, the one on the minutes, I agree with. Like the minutes should be posted. Yeah, I, agree. I watched that meeting, the selectmen's meeting, and the chair had a question about the fact that there were two members of the board of selectmen yeah. on this, and that you were not on, on this board of selectmen at the time. Right. So he was questioning your continued right. activity on this board. Yeah. I don't think that there's a conflict because the. Well, the chair thought there was. Yeah, well. You're right, Kathy. That yeah. was brought up. Yeah, he did bring that up. Like the board of selectmen. Because. Um, yeah, that's what it was about. It wasn't about the 
But it's, it's, it's two of us on this committee. It's permissible, yeah. though, isn't it? I believe I it was is. the select person on the board, and Joe was was before he was elected. Mm -hmm. So then it became two of two of us sitting on this committee re making recommendations and sending them on to the selectmen. And here we are again. Weren't there no appointments in July, though? So it was, was addressed at that time. Yeah. Well, it, it, what, you know what I'll do is I'll get a, um, I'll get a, a, a legal opinion about that. Well, I think the opinion is related to if we're making a proposal yeah. and two out of three board of selectmen who are on the committee on, are voting on those. Is that the concern, Betty? Right. Yeah. That you already have the answer before it goes up? Back to Lisa. <laughs> is that the issue that you already have the answer before it goes up? Yeah, because so. you voted in subcommittee. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I see that play out in, in, in all well, that's, 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 in that's all that's that's political done. forums, in that you have John, members of legislature on subcommittees, and they vote, and then they re-vote when it's brought before the floor. So I don't think we have a conflict. But let me it, ask you a question, it, John. It, maybe it, you might it, be able to help us. Maybe a duplicate. Uh, I'm looking at the um, the recommendations, and I think some of them do require a vote. Maybe I we should just talk right. about them oh, and figure right. out which ones require a vote and which don't. Exactly. My question is: uh, uh, the chair of uh, the board of selectmen the other night uh, brought up a, a very good point. He said that. Um, I should resign from this committee. You? Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is because it would be some Did conflict. Did he say you specifically? Specifically. He, told, he, he specifically that? said that. He said, I think Joe should resign from the board, uh, from the committee. Uh, <laughs> so, no, he was very specific about that. If you watch the tape, he was okay, very well, specific I've about that, which is not a problem. I think he brought thing. up a very good point. Uh, but my question is this, John. I don't know if you might be able to help us with this. Would it be a conflict of interest that Betty and I served on this committee on the Grove, uh, Government Advisory Council mm -hmm. as part of a committee, and then this committee now has made recommendations to the Board of Selectmen? Can we also be on the Board of Selectmen and vote for those recommendations, either vote or against them, for or against them? Is it, would, it, would that appear to be a conflict? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that it, it would. I don't think it even it's an appearance of a conflict. Right. And, uh, you know, number one, the Selectmen voted to have positions filled by selectmen. Right. Or you, well, you became a selectman in the interim. That's right. Uh, so I, I yeah. you know, the yeah. fact that Betty was voted to be on this committee as part of its role, I, I think the, it's an acknowledgement by the selectmen back then that, that a, a selectman on this committee yeah. wouldn't be a conflict. Yeah. And, the board, and the committee was suggested and created by the board of selectmen. Yeah. It was their suggestion. It wasn't even mine. I yeah. presented yeah. a yeah. different scenario. And, and yeah. the, the both of you don't represent a controlling Exactly. Percentage well, on this committee. You're, you're not getting any you, you, gain. You're still a personally. minority on the board. No. You're not getting any gain personally from this, and certainly it isn't an appearance because uh, of a conflict because you, you're out in the open it's about it. And you were, you were, one of you was appointed by the selectmen. Right. And this and is an no advisory funny. only. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is this committee is advisory in nature only. It, ha exactly. it has no executive authority right. whatsoever. Right. 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 Okay. All we can do is make. Uh, uh, recommendations. recommendations about information that ga that's gathered, and if the board of selectmen, uh, be it through procedural or the, cha the chairman, chooses to act, well, or, or like I said, I, I think Don, Donnie brought up a very good point. Uh, I didn't feel that there was a conflict, but well, the, the thing I, I find important having selectmen on this committee is the fact that uh, if we didn't have anything from the board of selectmen here. We'd be operating in a vacuum as to how it's what it's like to be an administrator in a town. Yeah. Well, that's why everyone is represented, and we try to bring in, uh, you know, all of the committees and all of the departments to listen to them. So we're not talking at anyone. We're gathering information from the people that do people that do their job every day they go to work. So, you know, you bring that insight in. Without you here, you know, how will we ask the other exactly. invited guests how they interact with the Board of Selectmen without that exchange of information okay. between the Board of Selectmen? And that's a, a primary, uh, that was, that's, that's a key uh, part of our charge is to find out 
the interaction between the departments and the Board of Selectmen and how that functions. So how could we do that without the Board of Selectmen? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, think I, I just think that would be a huge void. We would, we would be caught up in a situation where we're we're, we're listening to people and say, well, I wonder what the Board of Selectmen well, thinks of that. Let me use a hypothetical. We have nine selectmen throughout the, di the three right. districts, uh, three towns, and let's say they want to put together a committee to regionalize government, and they have two members from each Board of Selectmen on that committee with six private citizens. I don't see that as a conflict at all. Well, then they're going to be on the vote. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. 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 And then they're going to vote that, on Things the like matter. that can happen. <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was an, an email that was sent out, I don't know if everybody saw it, and it was directed at this committee. Uh, Unsigned, oh, so the government advisor? No, no, it was sent by a department head, so um, wow. that was sent to everybody in this board. Every when, when did it come? Department head in town. No, when it wasn't it? sent to us. It wasn't sent to us. All right. So I haven't gotten anything related yeah, to this. Yeah, but there was a, there was a list of people that it was sent to. Um, was it pro, con, and different? Well, it was as if it's negative. It was negative. Yeah, right. it was negative. It didn't further the, you know. So it was, you know. The, so, so shall we, as a committee, uh, line item those specific recommendations that we would wish the board of selectmen to vote on? Say that one more time. So, of all the recommendations that we have made and will perhaps continue to make. Um, Maybe we should nitpick the ones that specifically we're asking the Board of Selectmen to vote on. Yeah, I have the list right here. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one was to improve availability of information. The recommendation was to um, have meetings posted electronically within 72 hours. Minutes. Minutes. Minutes, yeah. Minutes, yeah. Excuse me. That one, I think, requires a vote. Okay. Are you able to highlight them and send them to me at some sure. point? But, but you can still share them now with the group. So. I mean, does this require a vote on our part? I, mean, I, think I, like I don't think it requires a vote. I think it just requires you know us talking about it. Clarification of yes. what we, we request. You know what I like about that there. also? That individual other boards and committees fall under that as well. Because mm -hmm. you know, I have no clue what's going on with the conservation or is it, yeah, to, to some degree I mean I have to go find it but I think the tough part is that's what we're asking for how do you enforce it well we'll get to that yeah, the, <clears throat> pieces. Um, the next one is to ask town departments to explore insource insourcing versus outsourcing in order to reduce cost of projects we, can I can I tell you something? The other night we had a discussion. There's only one construction project in this town right now, and that's the bathrooms at Shanahan. We're actually considering that possibility. So there you go. There's a recommendation yeah, that's not getting not oh, getting right. voted on, and we might act on. Right, yes. Betty? We talked about that. We're going to talk right. to Bob yeah. Arakillian about the, that. The, the, the GAC's good work. I mean, it's it, per GAC. it permeates. It's GAC. It's GAC. It's through it's well. Even though it might not be voted on, it through osmosis and somehow. <laughs> Gets put into play. <laughs> well, I think there's a value if some of this does happen without a vote from the Board of Selectmen. To me, I, I would love to see the planning yeah, board run with an idea instead of being, you know, told. Not that the Board of Selectmen could tell them anyways, but I, I think it's exciting to see some of our work take life on its own by boards and committees that would wish to perpetuate. Right. Well, I'm the one to prioritize the highway commission as elected position to an appointment. That goes to the taxpayers. I, I, Any, I totally to town agree meeting. with that. I think it's so asking for it to be on the warrant, though. Well, I, I think it is my, my idea year. was that, uh, my thinking was that the, we made the recommendations, the selectmen would decide whether this should go on a warrant or not. On that one there in particular, yeah. that's a really big one. And, that, and it's voted down already. Yeah, people don't have a good, I don't think it's presented in the right way or something. People think it's taking away their right to right. choose oh. rather yeah. than. Boy. The yeah, but to take it to the next step. Too. Yeah, but to just put it on a warrant and it's just just put it out there, it doesn't work. You, no, you, you'd have to have a hearing where education. you where you bring people in and you and you hear the argument on both sides, for and against. Before you get to town meeting. Before you get to town meeting. I mean, right. you know, it goes back to what Debbie was saying at the last meeting about the finance committee and just having knowledge. And, and then goes Debbie that said, "Should really have explanations in the town warrant that said, you know." 
hey, this is why we're recommending for or against if they rule. And that's been I get on town meeting floor time after time. Yeah. And still people see it as if they're taking away yeah, our right to vote. But there's also the chance you might get a road commissioner who is a philosophy Major. professor oh, in Merrimack College. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Who likes drugs? Yeah. Yeah. Or an accountant or a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. My son's a philosopher major. <laughs> when I look at these... Uh, I always wanted to drive a, a snow <laughs> plow. Sounds awesome. I look at these and well, I'm, up, I'm up anyway. What else? Uh, it I mean, seems inherent to me that most of these do require a vote. Yeah. I'm just being oh, honest. I, I think the best choice would be. They're recommendations, and my feeling is when you get the recommendations, okay. you have to review each one and decide what you're well, going to do. We should deliver that message. We could person. ask for a vote, but again, <laughs> we just true. we can't. Maybe we should ask for a vote for all of them. Let's make it That's easy. my opinion. We can't make the BOS. We work for them. We're under their charge. Yeah. So if we can get that on the board of selectmen uh, meeting uh, on our agenda, I, if you can ask that to be on the agenda, what's that? Nancy Lewandowski, you, you're the chair. You would have to. There's ask only them. six of them. Six of them. Can we put them, to put those on the agenda for a discussion as to whether or not a vote can be taken for them? Well, I guess the other so question is because this la this week they were just filed as correspondence, which doesn't mean. They're still on the agenda. We could still take a vote, but it's just not at the elevated at the level well, that it should we, be for a discussion. We, we as a, a committee of citizens, could ask that, that they be put on the agenda. Yeah, yeah. Well, one person could ask that it be put on the agenda. Right. We need we need a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, yeah I guess the only other thing that I would say is um, in looking at the email that you forwarded this week about what our charge was. Well, there's been some, you know. <laughs> well, I guess the language of that was a little bit. My concern was the language for me or the or the color commentary of the email. Oh no, I didn't read that. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to have a vote on that tonight? Or? No, the issue for me was that. Um, no, I wanted to circle back to the beginning. What is our charge? <laughs> no, well, no, 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 no. the one that you sent to us. Um, here it is. The welcome to the. It says. From Nancy. Yes. And the, the piece of that that I'm, it was the welcome letter to all of us. <clears throat> it was committee to concentrate on whether the membership of, of the BOS should be increased three from to three to five members. Review the current organization slash status of Brooklyn's town government and report back to the BOS with the committee's findings at completion of their work. See, the last part, at completion of their work, that's the piece that I don't necessarily agree with because to me this is an ongoing process. And to delay recommendations that we're making that could produce positive results, to delay that to the completion, to me, does not seem to make sense. Good point. Very good point. Maybe we should take a vote then tonight. <laughs> As to whether or not we want to deliver these to the level of asking the Board of Selectmen to vote on them at some point in the future. And maybe you want to take a vote. A, a date specific in the future. Well, well, I would also request that the Board of Selectmen revisit the charge and clarify whether it needs to wait till the completion or whether those recommendations can be provided on an ongoing basis. Okay. Fine. Let's do that. And that would be what a request of Nancy to put that on the agenda, and then yeah, you would, you would I, I would appear before <laughs> BOS or all. So I think it is. I think the board. We're just the GAC committee. So I think the whole board can come. I think the whole board. I think that's probably a better idea. The whole board should present them if if they can. If everybody can make it. Say you know, here's who we are. We've done this work. We you know we no, need to come get to the meeting. Yeah, we need to get to the next. We we would like to be elevated a little bit. Mm. Uh, not, not to be controversial, but if this is what we want uh, and, and if we feel that we're serving the town in a capacity, then why not? Let's do it. Well, the other piece is that if we're making recommendations and there's not any decision making on them, then what are we doing? Yeah, I'm concerned about that because I'm concerned about volunteerism. And well, it's like, who wants to join a committee and a board and just get involved in anything and nothing happens. Well, because that's what we're hearing has historically happened. I that this map, these different things have been put together and nothing's right. happened. I specifically remember in discussions with the selectmen at the beginning that the three to five was going to be 
place before the town meeting if, in fact, that was our recommendation? Well, it was placed on the town meeting last year, mm -hmm. so now the only thing that has to happen is it ends up on the ballot if mm -hmm. the legislature's the, 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 the legislation at the state is completed in time. Okay. But that, that's that in would, progress. That by the way, it's a home rule petition. By the way, it's okay. a, by the way, there's only one more committee that has to pass, and every, all the other committees has passed unanimously. And then I, it's I, I understood the same. second part of the charge is that we look at the government and make recommendations, mm -hmm. and but the point is well taken that we, you know, we, we need to get our recommendations before them. Uh, <coughs> I, I have a little different view about our work. I think this committee's work is starting to come to an end as far as whom, who we are going to talk to. Well, that was Dex on there, yeah. the, uh, the, if you look down Well, the Betty, had, Betty had a, a recommendation the other night, which I, I think is a great recommendation, and that is we should provide the courtesy of reaching out to all remaining boards and commissions to see who would else would like to make a presentation here, perhaps in January, and that's kind of like Kind of, a, kind of a wrap up meeting, if there, you will. There would be people that said, would, I, I know a couple of people that would love to come, even if we yeah. jammed them all in in one night. Yeah, we well, we were on that two nights. finance oh, committee, Kathy and I, back in the 90s. Yeah. We had many that. groups in it all together. Yeah. Yeah. I have another recommendation. So, how would we go about I mean, Write letters to all of the committee chairman? And I'm going to do the old fashioned, I'm going to call people. You're going to call people. I'm just going to call people. Some people I, may, some people may not. I yeah, think when you, when you specifically, so you send an email, if you specifically if ask someone to come, they, they may feel obligated to come when they really don't need to or right. want to. It's going to be yeah. well, Can we set a, a schedule and then if they, you invite them, we give them. Or, snow. We have them contact me and I'll. Okay. How so many because we, we have, to, we, we have you know, to spread I, it out a little. I, I, think, I, think, I think we've done. I, I think it's. Most I, I think. I think when you call, yeah. I, I'd prefer a letter. But when you call, it should be uh, in, in terms of we're wrapping up our work. Is there anything that your committee would like to come and talk to us about? No, 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 and, and if you do, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll arrange it. I bet you. My opinion. I'd love to have Bob Way, our new fire chief, come. Sure. But well, we need to talk to police and fire. Well, I, I would like fire, to. I, think should, you know, we need to get I would also like to suggest, and I don't know what needs to happen for this, that we consider the fact that our finance director has decided to take another position, and do we make any recommendations to the board of selectmen about how to Research whether that job remains the way that it is, or whether there are ways that that description could be examined to potentially meet some of the needs that we've discussed. Uh, just a word of caution about that. The, there was a state law that created Greg's position, as you know, and of course his position was also approved by town meeting. So that's unfortunately, because I know I'm reluctant and you are too to call the lawyers on that, but I'm wondering, by law. I'm wondering how much we can tweak that job and still keep it within the confines of what's legal. You know why, it, it, as I recall it's the bylaw, question. and I haven't looked at it in yeah. 15 years, uh, well, you created that. Yeah, I know, but he, he, <laughs> he does have some very specific duties under that bylaw. He does. And I think it may take an amendment to the bylaw. Oh. So even if we want to, let's say, well, let's say, for example, Greg actually has taken on a lot of duties mm -hmm. on his own just because he's a good guy and he's yep. you know, doing the right thing. Now, Lisa, for example, may be suggesting maybe can we write that into the job description, but you're saying even a small tweak could potentially well, require... Well, a perfect situation, the city council and the community saw it here, and it's not one that I did any work for. Uh, they decided they want to subpoena somebody in. Uh, and they have certain subpoena powers in their charter, but it wasn't for the purpose that the charter was written, and it was beyond the scope of their authority. So. Technically, you could give a finance director, as the bylaw has written, all the power in the world, and someday somebody may call him on it. Well, my question then would be, let's say, hypothetically, you were to appoint an interim and then re-examine that position mm -hmm. and go through the proper procedures. But that would be a monumental task. That would be like a reformulation of a committee that uh, John was on. And well, I, I think it's... Why, why, why wouldn't it be a recommendation of the board of selectors? No, yeah, if we recommend then go to town meeting. We, we, and they go to town meeting with it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we, as I recall, we discovered, I was surprised, we discovered <laughs> that we were a uh, municipality based on bylaw mm -hmm. and no charter. So it became rather easy to just 
amend the bylaw through town meeting. Oh, okay. All right. So, so it's not a monumental task. No, but good. Is it? Good. Well, that, that leads us. So what, I guess what we've heard at our meeting is is this. this there's a need for some sort of administrative manager function. As, and I'm wondering whether that, this is the opportune time to add talked some about language it several to that, times. So it's not that addresses op- some of those issues. There's now an opportune time to... How many members are missing here tonight? I don't know if we should take a vote or anything. Well, we, don't I, have I, to, we don't have to take a I vote. I think that by the time we get around to discussing the finance director's position, I think that you folks are going to be needing to... That at least we're going to be I think we should follow I think we should just follow through with our recommendations based upon Greg having spoken to us based upon what we know what the town may need mm-hmm. and then if we have an interim director amend the bylaws and if, if he or she wants well that's to I guess that's what I'm saying though is that rather than <coughs> Fill the position permanently. Not, why not take it as an opportunity to kind of just yeah. examine whether it's meeting the needs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go to an agency and get it temporary. It's up to the board of select. Yeah. Right. Well, but I mean, we can make the recommendation. I'm glad you feel this way. <laughs> I feel like I, you know, I'm in kind of in two two roles here. But well, I do. I, I was not. I will be. Um, I'm saying this on camera, and I'm 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 comfortable with. It. I was not. Uh, um, satisfied that our work was relegated to just correspondence the other day, period. And I believe it should be elevated to the next level of a clear cut, this is the work that we've done, these are our recommendations, will you vote on them? I'm I'm not understanding what you meant. Yeah, our recommendations were part of correspondence the other day Mm -hmm. at at the Board of Selectmen meeting. Mm -hmm. I would wish for them to be elevated to the level that they're beyond just correspondence, that they are actively an agenda item of which the Board of Selectmen should vote on. Mm-hmm. And is the mechanism f- to achieve that for me, you know, as chairman, to ask Nancy to put him on the agenda? Well, and to request that. Me- mechanically, would that, would that yeah. happen? Well, that, that, that and would you need to saying. mechanically say that and we, we're like requesting that they be voted the on? would like to attend. Well, because I, 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 I forwarded them, but I, I wasn't aware that there was a I understand procedure that. to get a And maybe I'm wrong. Selectman, if anyone asks to be on your agenda, you don't refuse. No, no, we, we're, we're not going to. Nobody asked us. Timing can be People issue. can walk in. Well, what Dan did is he just know, delivered the, the recommendations. He didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. It was just he delivered the recommendations, and they ended up in a pile called correspondence, along with other memos and letters and emails. Well, we'll so, I think, I think they're right, waiting so. for final final report. Yeah. But I, I think I, we can give interim reports. Along I think so. I would like to Go say ahead. one thing. I think that we've given everybody time that's come in. And now if other boys are going to get a phone call from a selectman instead of a letter from the chairman of this committee, yeah, I mean, I, it makes it more of a, I think you have to get a demand. Point. I think that's poor form. I think it's yeah, far too casual. Sure. Okay. And it's not official it's like in any capacity. Well, it may just be that there's a perception that they need it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that it was a demand rather than an invitation. Joe might get a better response. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm talking exactly about a couple of people that I actually yeah. and, quite, and quite frankly, I, I think... Enough for enough that Joe's helped get results of getting people yes. in here. Some I'm not sure that I bring that much clout to Some the people may have their feelings here that they're not, <laughs> they're not essential personnel unless they're given the opportunity. I, I will say, admittedly, it's two people in mind that actually approached me, but you're right. Otherwise, yeah. I should not. We're going to leave it up to the chair. I'd give them the same amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. Given well, I think what would be helpful then is... I'll reach out to people. Yeah. Just yeah. for you to identify. If I don't hear back, to identify if, uh, any can, uh, remaining... Right. I can identify two people for you. That's no, right. no. people can put no, the word out. No, what Lisa's saying is we need to go <laughs> from like A to Z and yeah. the directory So identify each and make sure that we send it to yeah. one to each one. Okay. Okay. Um, and not just, good. Yeah. This yeah, is good. Was I'll take out. care of it. All right. Are we going to meet in December? <laughs> I'd suggest a 24. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking the second week of December, and we could just meet amongst ourselves and circle back. I'll be away. You'll be away. Yeah. All right, that's a no. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's a pretty busy. Busy. It's a hectic it's a month. It is a very hectic month. And I actually have a couple of meetings. Yeah. I'm sure everybody's All right. Right. Fresh enough fresh said. Moving on. Fresh How about, in January is a good. I concept. think we should have two meetings in January okay. and try to stack in the, the what's. Who we want to see But next. we want to give people the same time. To, oh, yeah. it, it, in the effort of bringing some closure to our committee, 
Um, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Oh yes, the Board of Library trustees yeah, would like to. So, yeah. could we read some? So I have a list of people. The first, the first, <laughs> can we read the first in the last week of January? Can we schedule two dates now so that we can? That would be great. So that if we have multiple uh, acceptances on our invitation to attend, that I can spread those out amongst two meetings. We might have to rent them amphitheater. Yeah. Well, I have a question though because we might need a conference. Uh, I know that. Um, Greg is leaving December 9th, is that correct? Officially. Okay. But he's going to be. So I guess what my question is, is, you know, how quickly do you think the Board of Selectmen is going to have to act on that? And you guys will make a decision about how you're going to fill it and that yeah. sort of thing. I just don't know, do we need to make a recommendation that we would... Greg did say he will be coming in evenings and weekends to keep his work up to date. Um, I don't know how long he would be doing that because he's going to get into budget time with the mm -hmm. school. And the holidays present a, a challenge. I, I think I think it would be ambitious for me to suggest that we would be successful in choosing the, his uh, his replacement by the end of January. That would be ambitious. Oh, I can't, I can't see. We and can, I guess my question is, is will you take a vote possible. on whether it should be a permanent position or an interim position? Like, will you guys as a board of selectmen decide that together? Well, I, I never thought of it, but I, I, at this moment, I wouldn't think of hiring anything other than what the position already is. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, so even if, you, even if this board comes in and says, we ought to, you know, recommend something else, is that won't that won't happen for the next hire, I don't think anyway, because we have to get to one. You're saying you're going to make a permanent hire. Yeah, we we have to get to the next. We would have to first get to town meeting in April to change that position. Yeah, and you can't if, wait. If we, we, we can't wait that long. Well, if you had an interim, you could. Good point. And I did suggest an interim as a possibility for us as well. There are a lot of very qualified people. Yes, some, we spoke about that briefly you know, the other night. Yeah. So that is a possibility. I, I could put it on the agenda for the first day we meet in January to look at whether or not we want to recommend a yeah, my only concern with some is that management if, duties. If we miss the boat, it just makes things harder. Well, it's I like, understand. The town meeting will be here. All right. The, the, it's not very far. First and last week of January. That's what I suggest no, I mean, for uh, Thursdays. two meetings. Thursdays. 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 Do you have a calendar? It's Thursday the 6th? Is that what you're thinking? Thursday the 6th. Oh, wait, wait. No, that was me. Sorry. The uh, Thursday the 9th. Yeah. Is that the first one? No, the first one is the 2nd. Yeah, you don't want it that early. No, we can't be coming. No. Don't be free coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't be yet. So what you'd be looking at is probably <laughs> January 9th and January 30th. I like it. Yeah. That sounds good. Do we I'm sorry, what's it? January 30th. Um, 9th and yeah. 30th, okay. Okay, that works. At 7 p.m. It works for everyone. And people will just look at this and come back with a decision uh, next meeting. Yes. But I'd like us to consider the method that we're going to distrib distribute the survey. Nancy. <coughs> He's well, got if you can't get the okay. minutes on somebody, how are you going to get the survey? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, the survey is just, <laughs> no, the survey is just an email sent to each person. I walk around and hand it out to everybody. No, the survey is just an email that comes to you and you just do it online. It's pretty easy. Take a day out of work. Take this with the cemetery crash with the people and then somebody even that old. I don't have a lot of computer skills. Yeah, I don't like the computer myself. What did you say, John? A lot of people... It hurts my eyes. You know, forget about the people who, who came of age before the computer. A lot of people who came of age during the computer era that still don't have a lot of skills. Yeah, and we're the ones in real trauma. Yeah, and, and everywhere I go, I see this. It just oh, irritates me. And, and the baseball frankly. game, the soccer <laughs> game. I mean, you're watching your kids here, you know... <laughs> I think it's an opportunity to fill this position. But people are still looking for very talented people out there looking for. Sure. Yeah, it's still jobs. a recession. It, it, it is. It's <laughs> for a lot of people. So and even Don Graney said, "Do do we need? Right. How many hours do we need?" For so this now position? let's try to project a board of selectmen meeting where you folks will come if that is the night that will be on the agenda, asking the board of selectmen to uh, vote for the recommendation. Want to try to project that because those are Monday nights. Is it the second Monday after the ninth? 
Oh, I have one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have one of those. Yeah. How about, yeah. we can scan it and give it. Betty, when do we meet on the Board of Selectmen? I know we've been meeting almost every Monday, so I got, is this a second and, what is it, second? Every other Monday. Every other Monday, so. So, we, can, so would it be okay for the 13th, if that's the Board of Selectmen? The 13th of? December 13th. January. January. Oh, you want to do it in December? No, no, I'll, December. I'll be away. Oh, in, let's do it. I'll, I'll, I'll be away. In December you'll be away? I'll be away in oh, December. 4th through the 17th. All right, so we'll wait till January, the first uh, I gotta be honest. Yeah. Three meetings in one month is gonna be a challenge okay. for me. And we have other. Well, how about I go to the board of selectmen meeting, ask Nancy to put it on the agenda, and I present what we've already submitted in correspondence. I'm absolutely me. fine with that. And oh, ask. Yeah, I, I would go just to, to see calendar. you. Yeah, if anybody else wants to go, and if anybody else wants to go, it asked that it be voted on. And John yeah. will attend also. Because I think I'll try as long as it's not mandated. People okay, can good. Come. That's yeah. fine. And oh, yeah. so, so what day is that? The 13th well, we, is a Monday? Yep. Yeah. Oh, but I, but I would want... Christmas. Yeah, but Wait, I would want to be there. Yeah, but I will be there. Okay. Or is that the 20th? No, I'm talking January right now. Yeah, Martin Luther King Day is <laughs> a January. So, uh, oh, that's so do you have a calendar? Be back. Yeah. Martin Luther King is a January. I have a calendar. Board of Selectmen is meeting oh, the 13th right. of January. Yeah. No, and what about, what about in December? What are the meetings in December? Well, you've got December 4th, 11, 18, and 25. So which days do you think you might meet? 4th and 18th. Hold well, on, we'll I have it on Betty, won't you? Betty will be back the 17th. 17th. So after the 17th, are the we second, scheduled to meet? Well, the 2nd, the 16th. And? The 30th. 30th. Okay, 30th. 30th. Are we going to meet on the 30th? December 30th. Yeah. The Board of Selectmen meets on Monday, the 30th of December. What date are you leaving, Betty? Fourth. She'll be back well, on the Well, technically, 17th. the second is even an option. Yeah, so it, it is. It is. December okay. second. Oh, December second is yeah, an just, option. Yes. Yeah. Just let me know what day. You want to do that? Yeah. No. Why not? Yeah. No, we have like four. Oh, that's that's right around the corner. Yeah. No, we need a little bit more time. Uh, let's shoot. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah let's shoot week. Monday. Let's shoot court, for Monday court, the thirtieth then. The Mon does Monday, December 30th work for you, Dan? Yes, it does. Sorry Monday, about December. that. Sorry. If there is a board of select meeting no, that's that okay. night, I'm not be be workload, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Dan, it's okay. I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of names of people to invite you to the next oh, meeting. Uh, uh, so, I will Bring the attempt to attend the board of selectmen meeting on the 30th to present our recommendations and ask that some of them be voted on. And the others to consider so, um, our work um, and our time and effort. Who is who is the representative for the library then? Who should Lisa be? is the chair. Oh, Lisa. Then. Now, do we have a, a what big kind of interview? You then, as on behalf of the library. Should we talk about big picture and bringing closure? Should we what set a deadline? And well, I think we, we should probably try to wrap up business before the end of our okay. appointment yeah. in June. <laughs> Yeah. I hope that we do that. I, I hope think so. so. Yeah. yeah. I think we should, yeah. So we could even take a break in even April. March and April. Yeah. During tax season. During tax season. Oh, for my own, right. for 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 my own self. Yeah. 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 We should I think the board I think it, this that, would, that would coincide with, you know, town meeting and mm -hmm. people if they want to go, you know yeah. you know push for things that are important to them, then it takes the politics away from the right. uh it, it takes that, you know, sets that aside so we have a little bit of a hibernation period so people can go do what they got to do as for, uh, in preparation for town meeting. I think that would be good. It's, uh, just, just so you know, my recommendations for people that the chair I'm going to recommend that he uh, invite would be Nancy Lewandowski, mm -hmm. our, new, our new fire chief, Bob Lake, uh, Dick Shaka, who has an excellent idea that he's uh, reviewed with me. Um, regarding how a five-member board can act as liaison Wasn't officers. Gonna, didn't I invite him? Wasn't yeah, he on the yeah, chat or a few times? And, uh, and, then a, and then a representative from the from the library, <laughs> and we have her right here at the so, table, Lisa. So, we'll try one more time. What about the 
put the chief of police in. We're going to do fire. Well, he did come in already, but, yeah. but I, he came in. No, that was not a five member. Board. No, that was a five member. That was a five four. Okay. Four. I think I think we need to at least get some. Yeah, uh, but we did talk to him about liaisons with BOS. I think we ran the gamut at that meeting. Well, it's up to you, well, but why don't we just say if he wants, why don't we invite him, invite him also? If he wants to. Because that would be a double up. I'd like to talk to, you know, uh, planning board, uh, conservation. Well, we had planning board. Did we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we, we did. Had we had the planning board. Marble Hanley and Marble Hanley. Marble Hanley. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Separately. Yeah. Did we have conservation commission? No. no. We haven't had conservation. Oh, no. What about... Um, Mike Dempsey. Dempsey. Yeah, he's not Dempsey. from conservation. Mike Dempsey. Okay. Yeah, um, that's a member of the Housing. I'll reach out to people and uh, uh, we're, we can go. We can go so far. How about surveyors and fences? I don't want to see the tree water. I want the dog that tree. Is that Mark McCabe, the tree water? Yeah. I want to see the tree water. I'm not happy with the trees and grove. It's after 9 o'clock. Oh, don't uh, tell him. The kids are in bed. Is there, does anyone want to bring up anything else before somebody makes a motion to uh, wrap, wrap things up? Yeah, yeah, I think this is I'll second motion. Second all those in favor? Aye. Aye, Janet, we're done.